uh, participating from the select board and has participated once before while he was running, but now that he's officially uh, a select person, we're very happy to have him here. Um, so I'm Tanya Bodell, chair of the Alternative Energy Committee, and it's great to have you, Corey. And Steve, why don't you give a little bit of background in your interests, and then followed by Mayor Joe. Hi, I'm, I'm Steve Wenner, um, maybe the person with the longest tenure on the committee or at, the, at this point. Um, I'm uh, chair of the aggregation subcommittee. And uh, another interest is um, the Heat Smart and um, uh, Solarize Plus programs, which we hope to get going later this year. Mary Jo? Sure. Um, hi, Corey. Congratulations. Um, I'm, um, I'm someone who's been on the committee for seven or eight years. I'm not sure I've been a, a, a vice chair and a chair, and um, I'm really pleased to be able to pass the baton to Tanya because I just tried to recruit her about three years ago, and it took a while to get her to actually step into the shoes that fit her so well. So um, I'm, I'm just an active member of the committee and fill in as, as needed, whether it's working with Steve or looking at town hall. Um, but uh, mostly um, I'm delighted to think about the way green uh, communities has really changed the profile of our town. That was a huge initiative. And uh, a real priority and challenge in my mind is trying to connect what we're doing to what's happening in the school system. Because, um, you know, there's just a, a gap right now, but there are great opportunities to not only think about a solar arrays at the school, but um, think about how the, the faculty tune into what we're doing in any class, science, public speaking, you, you name it, and it's relevant to what we're doing, math, et cetera. So nice to meet you. <clears throat> Patricia and then Mike. Hi, Corey. I'm Pat Gooding. I've been with the committee for about four years with one year off in between and um, vice chair this year. And uh, all the things that Mary Jo said. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Mike Schmidt. And then Mike Mary Schmidt, um, congratulations, Corey, on your position. Um, I currently work at Hull Municipal Light Plant as the Assistant Operations Manager, and I'm hoping to bring uh, operational and engineering knowledge and expertise to the Alternate Energy Committee. I've been a member since last October. And then Michelle, I don't know if you've already introduced yourself to Corey, but you're free. I haven't, and I apologize if it's still humming. Um, so, Corey, congratulations. Um, I work in Town Hall as the Contracts and Procurement Manager um, and as a liaison for this committee to make sure that they get all the messages that are in everything that's happening in Town Hall um, gets voiced to this committee, and if there's any concerns from the committee that I voiced at Town Hall. Great, thank you. And then also we have members of our subcommittee. Tyler Thibault is a member of our subcommittee. He works for Eversource. He's amazing. Um, Steve Girardi, who works at Hingham Light Company and is now Water Commissioner. And so that's a great partnership because the Water Commission has some sites that we might be able to capitalize upon. And Debbie Cook, who's been working with Steve on the community aggregation. So it's been an amazing committee and it continues to be. So. Do you want to give a couple of words? We're recorded. You're now an official politician, and they always like to speak. <laughs> nah, I'm, I'm getting used to that part of this role. But, uh, you know, I'm here uh, primarily uh, just as a, a person of, I'm interested in this. I'm so excited by this topic. I'm excited by what you guys are doing. Um, you know, I'm super into, you know, heat, heat pumps and solar arrays and, you know, all that kind of stuff I just find really exciting. So, you know, every uh, meeting and presentation you guys have had, I, I, I am hesitant, hesitant to admit it was for me like really exciting and, you know, maybe a little <laughs> edge of the seat. Um, we'll keep that you know, on the DL, but, um, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm excited to see 
where this goes. I think there's a lot of really great potential. So thanks for all the introductions too. And I, I look forward to watching you guys work and helping you guys and just being involved. Um, we haven't done any committee assignments yet. Um, so, you know, maybe I'll come back in a different format. I know Carrie was your liaison before and she's awesome too, but whatever, whatever the case is, I'm, you know, just love where this is going. So I'll be around. Thank awesome. You. That's good. Good, good. Well, thank you for joining us again. And again, I apologize when you're running that we didn't just make you a panelist. I think you're the only audience member, but you had some great questions. So we, um, we were psyched that you participated early on and Plus, less stressful of being in the audience. So I didn't mind that at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all right. So we are being recorded, just so you know, although it doesn't get posted anywhere as far as I know. All right. So now we've got some administrative. We are behind four meeting minutes. I think given how busy we've been, it's um, understandable. But I would like to get these approved so we can post them. Um, the first one is March 10th. Did everybody have a chance to review March 10th? And I'll just go one by one and ask for a motion to approve second. And then if there's any- Motion to approve uh, March 4th. Thank second. you, Steve. Thank you, Pat. All right, any edits or discussion for March 10th? Nope, all right. Why don't we, um, be, we have to do a roll call because we are on video. So I'll go Tanya, Steve, Mary Jo, Pat, and Mike. Tanya Bodell. I for approval. Steve? Steve Winner, I for approval. Mary Jo? I for approval. Mary Jo? Pat Gooding? I for approval. Pat Gooding. Mike? Mike Schmidt, I. Okay. Um, next, we're doing May 13th. Do I have a motion to, well, are there any edits or changes to March? I'm sorry, May 13th. May 13th. I think we've already approved April, just so if you think there's something missing, we already approved April, so that's now posted. Uh, May 13th, do I have a motion to approve May 13th? So move. Thank you, Steve. Second. Thank you, Patricia. We'll just keep that so that it's easy for Patricia to take the notes. Um, any edits? All right, we'll go through roll call again. Tanya Bodell for approval, aye. Steve? Aye for approval. Steve Weiner, aye for approval. Mary, Mary Jo. Mary Larson, aye. Pat? Aye. And Mike. Mike Schmidt, aye. Great. Okay, now we're going to June 1st. <laughs> uh, are there any edits or changes? Patricia, you did a great job on these, by the way. Thank you. All right. Move to approve. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Is there a second? <laughs> great. All right. Uh, we'll do roll call. Tony Bodell, aye for approval. Steve? Steve Winner, aye. Mary Jo? Mary jo aye. Patricia? Aye. Mike? Mike Schmidt, aye. All right, perfect, thank you. They're now approved. Unanimously, June 8th. Um, any edits? Steve, do you have a motion to approve? I <laughs> move to approve. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Patricia, okay, second? Yeah. All right. Any final discussion? All right, let's go roll call. Tanya Bodell, aye for approval. Steve? Steve Winner, aye. Eric Joe Larson, aye. Mike Schmidt, aye. All right, lovely, perfect. Okay, we've now approved them unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Um, I will turn these into final and send them for posting. Okay, let's do, next on the agenda is a debrief on town meeting. Um, yay, yay. Steve, I said this in an email, but your video was outstanding. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm glad it worked. It definitely was. It was outstanding. I, I was having trouble figuring out how to, how to transmit that large file, but finally, finally worked it out. Yeah, it was outstanding and it received unanimous support. So all the marketing you did, all that hard work that you and Debbie did in your subcommittee, just amazing, amazing acceptance. And just today, just today, Jeff Nothnagal and I were speaking. He said, Tanya, I want to thank you for all that you're doing. And the fact that we're gonna be able to choose and get a lower price electricity because of the work that you guys are doing, and I know it's a lot of work, but I just want you to know it's recognized and it benefits all of us. So that's great. Oh, by the way, did you see uh, the photo of Debbie Cook and the, and the uh, Mariner? They, uh, the, um, the reporter oh, was at the, at the meeting and took a picture of her in her car, <laughs> clapping. Applauding. 
<laughs> I know that was great. That was great. And I don't know. Did you see my husband on the cover? He was oh, no. yes, yes. holding up his his ticket to vote. Oh, his mask. That's online. that was great. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's great. And um, we got approval, which you'll <laughs> we'll talk about a little bit later. But we also received approval almost unanimously, not unanimously, but we received approval to lease for land and roofs, the school sites and um, town sites. Well, it's not approval to lease. It's approval to authorize approval, the Board of Selectmen to approve a lease or the school committee to approve a lease for the school sites. So we received that. That um, It was unfortunate we had to bring that in at the end because we did want to focus on community aggregation, but once the town meeting got delayed and that would mean that the special town meeting was going to be delayed. It was going to be too tight to be able to realize the benefits of the uh, subsidies that are available this year. And so we made sort of a, um, a dash. It wasn't the last minute mad dash, but it was definitely a mad dash to try to get that on the warrant and um, move it through. So we have the green light from the town and I look at it as very much an approval, as Corey was saying, very much an approval by the town to keep doing what we're doing. So that's very good too. So we're very excited. Anything else about, um, I guess what I'd like to do is everybody put your hands together and give ourselves a nice little round of applause and pat on the back. This was a great meeting for us. And we just, again, I, th I think it was very clear that we're giving um, a green light to go. So we appreciate that. Any other comments before we move off the town meeting debrief? Right. Uh, next is renewable energy procurement. Uh, <laughs> so now that we've gotten permission to, well, now that uh, the town has authorized the potential lease of some of the town sites, uh, the hard work begins and we'll need to go out to the marketplace um, what I'd like to do is just share my screen a little bit to talk about what this is going to look like and how this is going to operate. And then Michelle, definitely we're looking for feedback from you on timing, how we can do this. This is not our first rodeo. We have done it before and I took the lead on this. Um, we also might want to think about getting some funding to have somebody else, a third party, come in and do it. There's a woman who does a lot of these for the towns and there's money out there that's available that Patricia had directed us towards. So that's also an option. I think we should definitely not delay too much because as we work backwards, you'll see, you know, we really need to start um, going now. But if Michelle, you could enable me so I can share my screen. And then I'll pull up. Perfect. All right. So I'm pulling up, if I can find it, a document that we presented to the board, the select board, before it was called the select board. And I am not finding it. So hold on one second. Let me pull up one more time. Shoot, I had this up. Hold on. Let me find out where it is. Okay. There we go. All right, we're at the end for questions. So this was what was presented to the select board on March uh, 26th, which talks about what we're looking to do. So there are a couple of things. One is the town has only purchased 20% of its usage through the solar energy array that's on the old landfill. So that means that we've got about Two, mega, um, two megawatts of capacity left that we could purchase to fill our usage, to, to fill our needs. If we combine that with storage, 
there are some incentives we could take um, advantage of. But there's a couple of ways we might do this. One is with the town sites, and we've just received approval to lease those. The, and, and to do that under the permission to lease, we'd have to do a Chapter 30B procurement with no upfront capital. So a developer could come in and basically enter into a long-term contract with us and front all the capital. The benefits to doing that is that developer gets to take advantage of all the tax credits that the town does not because the town does not pay taxes. The second is to do a public site. Um, so for example, the MBTA canopies uh, that we've talked about pursuing, and I think we should pursue that. I did have a conversation with Rick Schiffman last night, who as at workstation, he's already made an introduction to the owner of the transit oriented district. Uh, that would be a perfect little microgrid. And there's a, a reason why they might be able to do it themselves, but the town might be able to support that with a long-term power purchase agreement. And in the event of a, an emergency, it could be used to power that microgrid. And so the, that would take a bunch of load off of the system so that as we move towards a muni grid or town-wide microgrid, we don't have to support uh, some of the usage of that retail district. The other example of a public site that we have not yet received permission to lease uh, or to go forward with leasing would be the Water Commission properties. And it turns out this is, um, there, there is a, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize this, but um, thanks to an introduction that was made to us, we've been talking to Select and there is a um, loophole I don't want to call it a loophole, but there is a way that the town can lease sites without going through a competitive request for proposal process. Um, we can just talk about it briefly. Uh, my preference is not to do that without doing a competitive bid for the sites that we know we have. But the point is that we could also include some of the Water Commission sites as part of our RFP or um, do it through this, this side deal type of thing. I don't want to call it a side deal because it's totally legal, but do it through this um, avenue that's available through the state laws and put that on before the end of the year if it's less expensive, if it's less expensive. But we would want to do these all at the same time. And then the third is a private site where we might say, for example, the um, building that's being built by Stop and Shop, Staska's building, we might say to him, look, would you lease that roof for a solar energy array that the town would purchase the energy from? And it could be used by you during the event of an outage. Or we could say to um, the swim center, could you lease your parking lot for solar canopies? And we would purchase and you could use it or maybe you use some of that, purchase some of it yourself to save on the pool heating expenses. And, and the town could be a backup purchaser in the event something happened over the 20 year process. Developers are going to probably feel more comfortable if the town is backstopping that purchase. So all of this I think we want to now price before the end of the year and have contracts signed for most of the remaining energy that the town could purchase. And to do this all at the same time, to be able to get comparable pricing and then pick and choose what are the best options for us is really what we need to do next. These are the next steps. Now, um, on the agenda, it identifies what this um, MGL, the, the General Laws Chapter 164, Section 137, is the way that we could install solar energy arrays on um, some of the water commission or, or other town roofs that we have not received permission to lease. Um, so that is an option. I, again, I think we could pursue that if there are some town sites that might be able to host solar that we didn't get approval for. Uh, and, and we should go forward with that to, to do a price comparison of taking advantage of Chapter 164, Section 137 versus the request for proposal. Um, so these are the ways. I think we should also think about doing some private site outreach, um, reaching out to 
some of these and, and maybe ideally given a list as part of the RFP. So if it turns out the school roofs don't make sense and the developers have looked at the school roofs and said it's just not going to make sense, they could reach out to these third parties and negotiate what a lease would look like and incorporate that into their price. So, so Tanya, a quick yes. question. I'll pause, so yes. If that happens, like I'm, I'm picturing the place that has Nguyen's Kitchen and the uh, <clears throat> Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, can you picture the site that I'm talking about? It's yes. right out in the open. Is What's the incentive for the owner to do, it's, um, you know, most, for example, the um, <clears throat> the Vietnamese who run Nguyen's Kitchen, of course, are just leasing the property. But mm -hmm. there is there a, a how do you set up the incentive? Have you ever seen uh, the way that is structured? Uh, I mean, surely there's a benefit for the owner to say, "Oh, sure, go ahead and do that." But could you do you know much about the incentives for that? Yep, there's one of two ways we could do it. I think the first thing is start the education of these private sites so that they, if they are interested in saving on their electricity costs, they're looking at it themselves because it's part of the broader microgrid concept. If we can take the large load like these retail centers off of the system, then we um, don't have to size up as large a generation capacity to be able to service the rest of the town when we're trying to aim for reliability and resiliency. So the f one example would be to educate them and say, look, this is a deal, it's happening, we're going through this process, um, we would like to include you as a potential site and allow the developers to come speak with you. Um, if you wanted to do it directly and incorporate, it'd be the owners of those sites, not the ones who are leasing them. But if you want to do it directly and uh, use your parking lot or your building to host solar energy to service your own demand. Um, that's one option. And so their benefit would be if the price comes in lower than what they'd be paying national grid. But the other alternative is that there'd be a lease payment that the, um, for example, with the swim center, the swim center could be paid a lease payment to host the solar canopies. And those solar canopies would be put on the parking lot. They would shelter the seniors in the winter when the snow is there, prevent the ice from forming, and it could be used for shade during the summer, um, and obviously the spring and the fall. And in that case, the benefit or the incentive is the lease payment, and the developer incorporates a lease payment into the price that we Pay. So ultimately the town's paying the price for the lease, but it's rolled into the price for energy. The right now, the benefit of the town site is we don't charge a lease payment and we don't charge property taxes. So all the benefit goes into the lower price. So um, um, the reason that I think it's a little complicated and, and perhaps uh, you answered it and I didn't, I didn't quite understand the, the, um, the person, the, the companies that are, the businesses that are uh, leasing the property are paying the electric bill. Mm -hmm. So, but they don't own the property. Right. And, and so in that case, that's actually one of the biggest problems that's preventing a lot of investment in energy efficiency is the building owners aren't paying the electrical bill. Right. So they don't make the investment. Yeah. And yeah. it also would go to the solar energy array. Mm -hmm. So, would there be interest? The main reason there'd be interest is because of the backup power, possibly. So for example, with workstation, they don't have backup power right now. So when the town goes out, workstation goes out, and that's been a big problem. The medical center, it's the same thing. The medical center and the um, sports complex is, is another example of where you might be able to host some sites. But definitely, you're absolutely right you'd have to talk to the owners and understand what the incentives are. Yes. There might be, they get the lower price and charge a higher rent. Oh so, gosh. I mean, everyone's struggling. I, I, <laughs> well, I mean, but it, the, the difference between a higher rent versus a lower rent plus a higher electricity bill, if at the end of the day, the total rent is less than what the lessee would have paid, 
it's helpful. I, I guess I would uh, think of it as um, because most of these restaurant businesses are, are really quite vulnerable right now. And, mm -hmm. and everyone, every business that's been in that location has struggled, although it's a beautiful location. So I, anyway, um, it's, it's, it, that is very tricky. Trying, what we're trying to do is reduce the cost to the business so that the business it, it's, um, maintains a, you know, a consistent source of income for the owner is the, way, the only way I can think of to frame it. So you reduce the cost to the business. The, the business isn't who we talk to. We talk to the owners. Well, that's the issue. The owners, there's no incentive that I see for the oh, owners. Uh, could I interject a little idea here? Uh, yeah. Maybe as an analogy, you can think about the all the wind turbines that are being thrown up in the plain states and uh, Nebraska and Kansas and the Dakotas and whatnot. Uh, those are farmers and ranchers there that are simply leasing uh, space on their property to the energy companies to throw up those wind turbines. So they don't care about the power. They just they're they're just being paid. You know, like they would if they if a company were drilling for oil on their property. You know, they would just be. You know, they, they would get a monthly um, income from that. Yeah, so what would happen, Mary Jo, the incentive for the owner is they get a lease payment. Okay, all right. So so it wouldn't necessarily affect the business itself, They're like the restaurant business, their electric costs. Well, um, not unless, not if the town was the off taker. If mm -hmm. the owner decided, wow, this is a great deal, and so I'm going to just do it myself. They would have the lower cost and pass it through. I don't know what the arrangements are. I don't know what the, um, I don't think we need to second guess. I think we need to just approach and start the discussion and say that the town is willing to be the off taker if this is an economic option for us. Mm -hmm. Get the benefit of the backup power when the lights go out. Okay. All right, thanks. As well as a lease payment. So why would you as an owner want to do it? You get a lease payment. Does that allow you to pass through some of that benefit to the renters so that they can pay lower rent? That's up to you. We don't, that's not our call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if it's a cheaper site for us because brand new roof on Stasco's building going up next to Stop and Shop is a better rooftop than the schools and it offers a flat roof that's bigger than all the schools combined so true and cheaper even with the lease payment then less liability that may be the better option for us but unless we try to get some pricing on that and in, see if there's any interest we won't know tanya i have a quick question sure now would it be up to us to approach these businesses or would it be up to like a consultant or someone that's bidding on these projects to do the legwork, to do the <clears throat> figuring out which roofs are most beneficial, the owners, is, is that something a consultant would do or how would yeah, that so process work? Some of these, the developers are already talking to them. I know this. So, uh, for example, the swim center is already working with a developer to look at installing solar energy arrays for heating for the heating the pool um, for the water heating, but not for the heat. Yep. So they're already talking to a developer. I think that some of the um, commercial buildings have had been approached by developers and either didn't understand it or didn't want to deal with it or didn't have the incentives or whatever the reason, um, or are talking to them now. So I think our role would be to go to the Chamber of Commerce, for example, and explain what we're doing and the role that the commercial buildings could play if they had their own microgrids and the fact that the town would be willing to contemplate being the off taker of the energy so that they'd get the benefit of the reliability and resiliency but the town would get the benefit of the lower cost energy if it turns out to be a lower cost option. And if um, even with the lease, you know, they're interested in going forward with that. Uh, okay. Tanya, Excellent. could I ask a question here? Um, could it work uh, this way that uh, um, the town would uh, uh, 
talk to energy providers and and offer to backstop uh, you know be an off taker for any power that they could uh, generate uh, through these means and then they could use that when they negotiate with uh, customers and then the town wouldn't have to worry about you know who they're talking to uh, they would just find uh, you know uh, commercial and and private uh, uh, properties that uh, and owners that were amenable to the idea and they could just tell them that you know they could just, uh, they they would just have in their pocket uh, the uh, assurance that Cohasset would be the off taker of the power so they wouldn't have to worry about that is that, yeah, is that a possible approach for this it is an approach I think though that if we make it public that we would we the town are looking at this type of uh, arrangement to be the off taker it gives a little bit more legitimacy to the developers approaching these sites. And the other thing I have to say is we do not have to do a request for proposal to enter into this. If a developer came up to Chris Sr. tomorrow and said, hey, I've got a brand new building going up in Cohasset that wants to put solar panels on and they're letting me sell the energy to somebody else, would you be the off taker? We could sign that contract tomorrow. We don't have to do an RFP. We could do the same thing with the MBTA station. If those developers, and I don't know where those stand, um, but we should pursue that. If those developers get their acting or moving forward, we'd like to see from them what the pricing looks like. And so I guess my point is simultaneous with us putting out a request for proposal for the town sites, we also definitely want to make sure we put out the word to the developers, all developers, not just those responding to our RFP, that we would like to know also what the pricing is for private sites that we would be the off taker for. Because like I said, those might be the more cost effective assets. And as long as they're in town, they don't even have to be in town for us to get the benefit. They just have to be a national good service territory. But I think given the construct of the microgrid, we would like them to be physically located in the town and therefore able to be an asset used as part of the microgrid. Uh, Tanya, as on that last point, um, do we know what the actual, I mean, I know you've put up a, sort of a planned idea of where the microgrid lines would sort of be the parameter, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, do these things have to be contiguous to that? I mean, I know there's been some discussion about across public ways and all that what, what level of complexity is involved if this you know is half a mile from the microgrid line how does that work yeah so i think we have to think about on the microgrid versus the solar um the physical we are not going to be able to create a downtown mini grid without crossing public rights away which means we've got some discussions, ongoing discussions with National Grid about that. They're just not ready right now from a business model point of view to be able to move forward with that. Um, but anything that doesn't cross public rights away, like the transit oriented district, you could put the, um, for example, the MBTA uh, solar energy could be used to connect to the retail stores or solar on the stop and shop could be used to fire up a mini grid that takes into account that whole shopping plaza. Um, same thing with the Shaw's. Shaw's would be a great little mini grid as well. In that case, the purpose of those mini grids is not to supply energy to the town. It's to basically take large load off of the system so that we don't have to provide it as we develop a larger solution to the town's reliability and resiliency. Okay, that makes sense. But there, there's quite a lot of opportunity without crossing public rights away to do campus solutions. And we've identified those, plus, of course, the um, Dunkin' Donuts retail area. I mean, you could almost create a whole system. Uh, Mike's probably smiling right now, but you could create a whole shadow system along that retail area as long as it doesn't cross the public right away. Um, so anything, I, I'm not, I don't know where King Street is versus the transit oriented district, but 
as long as you don't cross King Street on either side, you'd be able to service those. But at some point we're gonna have, hopefully if this makes economic sense, we would have the ability to argue we should be able to cross the rights away. National grid will have caught up. You know, we're skating towards the puck on this one. So as far as the town being an off taker, is there any sort of physical constraint in terms of quote unquote being an off taker of that energy? No, so the key constraint is the queue and how much space is left in the SMART 2.0 program. So the only way that we can be an off taker to a physical site that doesn't feed our buildings, most of which except for the schools are the case, like there's no load, there's very little load at the DPW station, but that's where our landfill is. We can do that because of the net metering. In the case of the SMART 2.0 program, there are other incentives that allow for us to get a credit. The town can get a credit tied to the production of the energy on a different site. And SMART 2.0 also contemplates public-private partnerships, whereas the prior net metering program did not. So in the prior net metering program, it had to be a town site servicing, sending energy to a town. Or you could get a private site, but the town could be the only off-taker. Um, in this case, in SMART 2.0, this new program, you can have a partnership. So for example, with the swim center, they could take some of it, we could take some of it, but I mean, we get take it, meaning they could physically take it and we could get a credit for the rest of it. So the SMART 2.0 is really the constraint and that's why we're trying to get in as much as we can. Unfortunately, we're national grid service territory. And so we're now, there's a very long queue and we're at the back of the queue um, and they have limited openings because most of their queue was filled up with uh, open land and Western Mass. But there's some legislation now being considered to um, try to move towards sites where there's load as opposed to open land that takes down trees. Corey, you had a question? Yeah, just um, uh, while I'm following this, when you say the town is being an off taker, is that just for municipal use or can the town also function or be an off taker for what we would use in our energy aggregation plan? So when I say the town's an off taker, that's for, for the town's municipal use. So the town building, the school buildings, um, all of that. The, for, for the, yeah, so for the aggregation program, um, it's hard for the aggregation program to motivate the development of new solar because it's only for a couple years and it's opt out. So the contract's only for, you know, limited number of time and it, they, they, people, although it's an opt out program, they can opt out. So I would be very surprised unfortunately, because that would solve a lot of problems at once. I'd be very surprised if um, Good Energy is able to get a deal with a developer who's implementing renewable energy in the town of Cohasset. I just, I don't think it's going to be the cheapest solution uh, and it wouldn't necessarily take advantage of um, some of the net metering credits, which can be more generous for municipalities. And yeah, uh, a question. Um, suppose we were very successful beyond our wildest dreams here and we got developers to install uh, uh, enough solar power and batteries and so forth to totally cover all the municipal electricity uh, load. Um, is there some something we could do with any excess power there? Could we like uh, um, uh, sell it to commercial firms? Uh, uh, you know, have to give them some discount electricity just so that we weren't limited with the, you know, by the by the uh, uh, the town load. Um, so under the net metering program that we entered into before in the Smart 2.0 program, well. I don't want to say this in March too, under the net metering program, the answer was no. The town was capped. This is why we were very careful and why we didn't move forward with the school pricing and why we want to get pricing on everything. We have a limited amount of energy that we can get cost savings from. So we want to make sure we get as much cost savings from renewable resources as possible. 
um, knowing that this is a 20 year commitment. So the answer is under most of these programs, we cannot. Under SMART 2.0, however, which is where the world we're now in, this is why they're encouraging public private arrangements where you can put a larger solar energy array on a commercial rooftop, for example, that maybe produces too much for that site, but provides um, enough for the town or, or part for the town to be able to purchase. Um, and possibly that developer then could sell it under a community aggregation program someplace else because there's extra laying around. Right now, I don't think the, t the town can resell. It, but the answer is it depends on the program that we're using to be the off taker and, and the um, credits that are associated with that. But we can't get more, we can't, the town cannot get a credit for more than our bill. Okay. So we're somewhat restricted. If uh, we put up solar rays on uh, town facilities and, and generate more power than the, the town um, load, uh, then, uh, then we just wouldn't get any uh, savings from that excess power. It just go to national grid or whoever and on, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, right now I don't think that's a problem. The sites that we have permission to lease and the water plants don't, I mean, I think we'd be lucky if we got up to the additional two megawatts, which is approximately what would cover the rest of our load. Um, so I, but that was something that I was very, very concerned about the first round. Yeah, well, we had, we had discussions about that uh, years ago and talking about the school roof and we were wondering, gee, you know, do we have to be careful about exceeding uh, the town load there? And I just remember, remember those discussions. Yeah, that was before we realized how little they are <laughs> and that, that we're not going to get a lot okay. out of school roofs. But now we also have the ability to do canopies. Right, so suddenly we may have a lot more potential uh, capacity than we thought. The problem is the canopies aren't going to be a great as great a price as uh, the school roofs, which are not going to be as great a price as the old landfill. The old landfill was perfect, right? It's just it's an open field, nobody's using it. You put the solar energy arrays on it. It's the cheapest way to get solar energy. The roofs are more expensive because you have structural issues, the engineers have to come in, there might be some reinforcements, so it becomes a little bit more complicated. And our roofs even more so because you have to give us a one-time ability to take the solar energy array off to replace the roof and then put it back on just because of the age of the roofs. And the police department, same thing. It's very, very old. And right now we're not planning on replacing that, but we might depending on how this goes. Um, because sometimes the developer re will replace the roof as part of the installation. And in the ca case of the police fire department, we might do that. The problem is the police fire department may not be it. They might move it, but there's a study underway to look at that or, or possibly underway. And we'll get an update from Michelle on that. So, um, and, and then the more expensive one is the canopies. So we're really, we're going to have to make a decision. This is why I think the next six months are going to be very interesting because we have a limited amount of usage that we can purchase solar energy for the town's use, we really want to try to get the lowest cost solution. Otherwise, we are um, whittling away an opportunity. On the other hand, the opportunity might be closing because some of the federal, I mean, it just, it's very uncertain. It depends who becomes president. But, um, you know, the next four years may see a, an expiration of the solar ITC, which then makes it more expensive. And we don't know what's going to happen on the state. The state comes and fits and starts. So th there's a lot of moving parts, but I think we don't want to lock ourselves into a price that's above what we're currently paying. And we don't want to lock ourselves into a price that's worse than we could get someplace else. And that's why thinking about these private sites or other public sites as we go through the RFP process for the town sites that we've gotten the permission to lease is an important part of the exercise. 
Tanya, quick question. Are you following or familiar with the um, Roadmap 2050 bill that uh, Joan Machino is championing? Um, there was some publicity on it today. I didn't, I didn't get to see it, but I saw some um, social media stuff that it's basically um, all about, you know, energy efficiency and resiliency. And uh, it seems like there's great support for that at the state level. So could we possibly, possibly be looking for the state to step up and fund some of these things versus the federal government? And how does that well, that's Yeah, that's where the microgrid comes in. So the state loves reliability and resiliency, and we've already gone through the MVP program. I mean, we are very perfectly primed in position to be able to um, try to get some funding from the state for reliability and resiliency. And it's unclear whether there will be a state energy bill passed. Um, they're trying to get it passed. I think Joan's proposal, which I don't know the details is one, but there's also some other options that are being contemplated. But in all cases, from what I've heard, storage is going to be a key part of an energy bill if it gets passed before recess, which is in 15 days. So the end of the month, we have until the end of the month to know. And then if not, maybe we'll get but, but something next year that comes out. But the key thing is getting the solar now because they don't want energy storage to be funded to take energy from gas and a gas unit and store it and then reuse it. They're looking at funding storage to take advantage of renewables. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so I've these are great questions and great discussion as always. Um, we do have the sites, as you know, timing. Um, this is why we wanted to get the approval and, and move on it this year. Um, because there's just a lot coming together. So what does it look like? This is really what we're looking at for the next six months. We've got the approval at town meeting for the authorization to lease the town property. Um, we need to put together a request for a proposal and obtain the Board of Selectmen and the school approval to proceed with the RFP uh, on those six sites. And we can do that fairly easily by reviewing and updating the old RFP materials and developing an invite list. We already have five companies who have expressed an interest in responding to our RFP, which is great. That doesn't mean they will, but it's great that we have that and we can increase the list as well. Um, we then issue the RFP. Simultaneously with that, not on this chart, is that public outreach to try to see if the private sites would be interested, make it known to the developers and to um, like the Chamber of Commerce, for example, that we are interested, the town is interested in being an off-taker, if the price is right, um, continue to have discussions, present to the board of the swim center and explain why we'd like to con you know, consider maybe offering up that parking lot as a um, site. And that goes simultaneously so that when we review the bids, we have pricing comparisons that we can make. And so we're not looking at the school roofs, for example, in a vacuum where the school canopies in a vacuum. It may be that the canopies on the swim center are cheaper. I don't know. Uh, maybe the canopies on the MBTA are cheaper than canopies on the school sites. So I'd be surprised, but it might be. Um, so if the case, you know, we just need to be able to review those bids and then we award a contract contracts possibly to multiple uh, entities and negotiate the finalized terms. Um, there'd be some permit approvals and citing, but basically by the time we issue the RFP and give the award and sign the contract, which will be subject to some of these other permit approvals and citing, um, the goal would be to have that done by October so that the developer can move forward with whatever purchases, if they need to purchase. Some developers have already pre-purchased the um, equipment so that they get the benefit of the 30% from last year, or the 26% ITC. Um, I don't know the tax implications, but the goal would be to basically 
be done and have these awarded by the end of the year. Then construction could start and we could st have live solar energy by the end of 2021. It usually would take 12 to 18 months. So Tanya, what is the benefit of awarding to multiple um, companies versus one for different sites? Is there, there's a, is there a benefit to that or? We don't know. It depends on their bids, but it may be that um, one developer bids a very good price for the um, school parking and another developer did not bid such a great price for the canopies, but they specialize in roofs. And so they could do the rooftop. And then there might be another developer who has a good relationship and has already been in negotiations with a commercial rooftop or parking lot and has a, um, already has purchased at a, at a good price the um, solar panels. And so they can give us a better price. So it's, it's in my mind, the reason why we would separate it would be to get a better price and then um, have the security that if one of them goes belly up, like they did the first time, we can simply shift to the next best bid and have them go forward. Okay. But I think we say, you know, give us a price for each site that you would like to develop as well as a package deal and see what the package deal looks like. Okay. What's your thought? I mean, why, why would you be concerned with awarding to multiple? I, I'm not concerned. I just didn't understand the benefit of awarding to multiple. But there may not be. Okay. Uh, there might be one bidder who comes in and has the best prices across the board. Okay. I so, would think there would be some uh, additional administrative costs by having uh, several vendors uh, in these contracts, but that's the only disadvantage I would see. I'm not really so worried about that. Um, so I guess we'll just see how it plays out, right? Yeah, that, that's so, the goal. Yeah, so I so ideally to have the responses back by October. When are you? No, no, the contract signed by October. So oh, okay, we um, it's a usually a thirty day response time. Yeah. So we do a dog and pony show. We could start, you know, showing the sites, um, and then. Uh, pull together what we, you know, what the RFPs. Again, another question is, do we want to try to get some funding money for this? So when we talk about the grants, we'll talk about that. Um, and then I think we should aim to have the um, request for proposal issued September, early September, end of August. Okay. Are you going to, how, how no, no, are your no. vacation plans, Michelle? <laughs> no, I, I don't have any, just like everybody else. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. Um, I'm just thinking um, if you issue the RFP in September or late August, you give them 30 days to respond, and then you still have to review, um, you're, you're going to award, you're going to negotiate the final terms. I don't know if it's realistic to say it's going to be inked in October. Um, is that just your goal date or are there other reasons why October really works? Because if, if October is why it really works, I would say we should probably shoot for mid-August just to give ourselves a little buffer um, if, if there's a reason why October works best. I mean, look, I think if we are comfortable doing this ourselves, which, like I said, we did it ourselves last time, we have a template for a contract. I think we would just give them the same um, contract that we inked for the landfill and with some modifications for the schools, which had, we already have a template for that contract, which had been reviewed by a lawyer. 
So we have all the materials. If we want to proceed, I think we could aim for mid-August. Um, if we want to get a third party to help us, then I think it's not going to be done by mid-August. And, and if we don't ink the deal until November, mid-November, I think that's fine too. It's just these things always take longer than you think. Right, right. If we aim to get it inked by the end of December, it's too late. Some, right. Some, for some of them. Now, some of these developers, the large ones, have already pre-purchased the equipment to be able to get the 26% ITC. Okay. At the end of the year. So they are looking for places to use the equipment, but their equipment may not be the best equipment for what we have, right? If they have rooftop solar energy arrays, they can't put them on the canopies. Right, understandable. The equipment, so they can't do the roofs. So the only other small challenge to overcome to get something um, out on the streets by mid-August would be to obtain the Board of Selectmen and School Committee approval to proceed with the RFP. So I, I know the agendas have been um, kind of put on the calendar for the next few weeks. Corey, do you have any idea how, what they look like? Is there openings for the AEC to get before? go before you and request approval. Do you have any idea what that looks like yet? Uh, I, I haven't reviewed them yet. And, and um, you know, since we've got a new chair, uh, Diane and Chris are really kind of the ones that are kind of hammering out the, the, uh, the agenda. So uh, nothing concrete that I could really, you know, comment on that. Okay. okay. Yeah, we're, we're, I have an outstanding request to come forward for our second quarterly report. Because accordingly, the presentation was tied to the, well, we're looking at right now, was tied to approval for the um, town meeting warrant article. But I have an outstanding request. Diane knows that we would like to get before her. So this could be our focus of our quarterly meeting. Yeah, and we have, um, so on Tuesday, the selectmen are meeting for our goals. And you know, Diane has, um, you know, we've got a lot of things to talk about, obviously, but I, um, one of the things that I know that is on a lot of our minds is just, you know, improving communication with all the boards, including yours. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, you know, keep, keep your ears open for that. <laughs> I don't need my ears open. I just barge in and <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, we'll keep our ears open. And I think what we should do is reach out to the school committee about that and start to arrange some um, site visits for the schools. We can start that now before we do an RFP. Like I said, there's, um, we can put out a, as part of it, sort of like a pre RFP, say these are the sites that have been approved. And if people would like to do some site visits, we're happy to allow you to come do the site visits. Um, so we can start going on that. But I think definitely let's get on the agenda of the school committee and there's an outstanding request for the Board of Selectmen. Okay, great. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm now going to go back to the agenda and see if there's anything else. Um, so on renewable energy procurement, I think that's, We've covered all of these items. Are there any of these are great questions and a great conversation as always. Are there any other questions about the renewable energy procurement? Why we want to do some parallel paths outside of the town sites or timing or anything else that you'd like to ask or talk about? Just one last thing you were talking about getting a consultant potentially to maybe help with some of this. Um, I think we may have been looking at that grant that we got for the uh, $3,000 to do that. And um, Michelle and I spoke about that particular grant yesterday. And I guess that was pulled, correct, Michelle? Yes. Well, well, hold on, because we're about to get to the grant. So okay. All right. Which talks about this. But I think, Pat, there was another one, which is, was the DOER technical assistance grant which was separate from the $3,000. Right. And that technical assistance grant, which is open, well, I don't know if it's still open, um, was what we were thinking could fund 
a um, third party to help us with the procurement process and the RFP. But is there any other thing, anything else on the renewable energy procurement? And then we can move to the microgrid update and grants. I don't have anything additional. Okay. Um, so microgrid update and grant. So let's focus on the grants piece of this. Michelle, can you bring us up to date on um, where we stand? Sorry, I was talking, but muted. Um, <laughs> so I think we, we all know that we were awarded um, a microgrid consultant um, to work with us. We have not seen any documents other than that email that I believe it was a G. Um, it was G, correct? G consultant, yep. Yep, so um, they are who we're going to be working with on the microgrid, microgrid study um, for the two locations. Um, as far as the MAPC solar grant, we got an email saying that the DOR did not approve the funding for, for their assistance with the solar PV planning task, um, which was unfortunate considering um, the DOER is the one really pushing for all of these um, alternative energy measures. Um, but that's just, that was a grant that we applied for. Um, we were excited to know that it was going to come through and then of course the bottom fell out. Um, but like you said, there are plenty of other grants we can apply for. We can continue to look for additional assistance. Um, but that's where we stand with the, the three that we have. Um, well, so Michelle, on that one, we, we, when we were given that money, didn't we decide to forego some other money that we could have gotten? Nope. So in her letter, they weren't letting us forgo that money. They reappropriated it this year yeah. um, for the same purpose. So therefore, DOER, DOER took away the three thousand. So. Uh, okay. So it's not that we. So we did. We gave up the three thousand, but we received how much and for what? In total, we received. Hang on. Let me pull it. We received um, the annual report preparation. That was the money that was reappropriated. Um, we also received $1,500 for our, um, our 2021 competitive grant application. Um, and we received $3,000 to assist, to assist with energy data analysis, and that is the MEI program. Okay. So that is that that is the the three thousand dollars will help us clean up all of the data in there, which we've started to do, but due to COVID, unfortunately, that process has slowed. But I think we'll be picking that up fairly soon. Okay, so that's actually good because all of the developers are asking for information. Well, they're asking for our bills for specific sites. You know, do we have invoices site by site, or is it just one total invoice for allocated to accounts? We do have invoices site by site because when we began cleaning up the data um, last fall, we had to pull invoices, for instance, for the high school, middle school, and then we had to pull for the teen center. So they are coming in individually. So I think that's probably good news for this project. Okay, so then can we get copies of the invoices for the schools? Yeah. Each of the schools, at, well, each of the six sites that the town has approved sure. the lease. Mm -hmm. And I think Steve Girardi is working on getting the Water Commission invoices once he starts. Okay, we can get those as well. Um, but as far as the invoices, how far back do we want to go? Is it five years? No, we can go back two years, three years. Okay, three years. Three years is good. And the main reason is um, this past year gives us the price to beat. 
Uh, the last three years gives us some variation in weather conditions and most importantly, demand. Okay. Okay, so I can, I can work with Jane on pulling those. That'd be great. That'd be great. So Patricia, if you could make that an action item. Um, because yeah, those entities are looking for those um, details, the invoices, which I think is we have usage in electronic format, but they're looking for the invoices because they want to see what the demand is. And they want to see in the case of its time of use. I don't know if there's that much detail. But they might want to look at some of that. Yeah. Okay. Whatever the invoices are, we'll take those. Sure. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then what about the, uh, um, your submission for the study for the police and fire department, moving the, relocating the police and fire department? We haven't received any word back yet. Okay. So as soon as we do, I will let you know. Okay. Good. Um, and then there's this third one, which we haven't applied for, but Pat identified it, the DOER technical assistance grant. And this looked like it would be able to be used for applying for and hiring somebody to help us with the RFP process. What are your thoughts on that? Um, do we know what the time, I, I haven't looked into it at all. Do we know what the timeline is associated with it? Yep, it um, closes at the sooner of running out of money or August. Oh, okay. All right, so. It'd be fairly if, easy to. If do. it's out there, I think we should apply for it. Um, there's no reason we can't, especially if we have until August, which seems like a long time frame for us, which isn't very typical of how we approach grants. But um, I think we should go for it. Okay. All right, it seemed fairly straightforward. So I think um, one of the things we might wanna do, there is, I mean, I can give you my gut about what we would need. The other thing we could do is go to somebody who does this, um, Beth Greenblatt is a name that keeps coming up as somebody who does this for a living, um, helping municipalities put out these RFPs and managing them and putting together the documentation and all of that. So um, I can give her a phone call and get a feel for what we should ask for. That'd be great. We can do that. So um, action items would be for Tanya to give Beth Greenblatt a call to get uh, some feel for pricing. And then the other action item is for Michelle and Tanya to put in the request, to put in the proposal. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. As long as there's still money left. So we'll have to, I did send you that link. I think Pat sent the link around and then I responded. This would be a way we could do the RFP. It just would right. be nice if we did it and got it and could get going on it. Let me see if I can find out some information tomorrow. That'd um, be great. And then I'll let you know. Okay, perfect. Anything else on grants? And microgrid update. So the GE consultant, that was 75,000 per location. Was that the total amount? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Okay, and I think at this point, the $3,000 lost, it's better to be used on the data because we've already gotten the town's permission to go forward with six sites. And so now we're gonna let the developers decide what's, what's the best site to pursue. Anything else before we move to Solarize Plus? Okay, Steve, no rest for the wicked. So now, okay, well, um, that's really done community aggregation. <laughs> uh, I checked the uh, Mass uh, Clean Energy Center website today, and uh, they said that applications for Solarize Plus, they, they should start accepting them sometime in the middle of the year. <laughs> that's all they said. Uh, so they had no other information there. And, um, so anyway, I, I tried to call them and of course, nobody answered. I left a message and 
the uh, they said that they would respond within one or two days of leaving a message. So hopefully I can get some information. But right now, because of COVID, things are slow and and uh, they haven't got their act together yet on on uh, their application process. So that's about all I can tell you about that. Okay, and you'll same with, same, same way with Heat Smart. Okay, they had the same message on their website about Heat Smart. So can you share with us, um, I know we've heard about it before, but for Corey's benefit, can you give a little bit of background on the Solarize Plus and Heat Smart program and why we're thinking of pursuing it? Okay, so this is a, a program that is um, uh, administered by the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Uh, and the idea is uh, a bulk buying contract and an opt in, not an opt out sort of program uh, to get discount um, renewable energy uh, technology for residents in, in the town. So, um, uh, and, and the way it works is that a town has to uh, submit a, a proposal to the Clean Energy Center, um, and it's a competitive thing, but uh, thus far, I guess, most towns that have submitted have had their proposals accepted. And uh, the proposal consists of what sort of program uh, do we want to, uh, are, are we proposing and what sorts of technology and presumably a rooftop solar, uh, heat pumps, uh, it could be other things, could be uh, battery storage, even electric cars uh, and other things. It's pretty, pretty much wide open. Um, so we, we talk about what sorts of things that we think we would like to offer our residents in, in this program and we um, complete this application. I'm not sure how involved the application is because I haven't seen the, uh, the actual forms and they, they don't have them available yet, but that's, that's the idea. So hopefully it'd be a, now I guess Mike has told us that there are already tremendous uh, bargains on heat pumps, right Mike? So um, uh, hopefully we'd get an even better deal if we went with this uh, community group buying sort of idea. Uh, to offer offer a supplier, um, you know, a, a, um, a larger market uh, for for their products. So that's that's the basic idea. I'm guessing you guys have already um, are probably already talking with like town hall building committee for you know to, to try to leverage you know the, the bridge between building a new building and and uh, you know, energy efficiency you know as as a goal. You know, this seems like a, a pretty good place where there'd be some synergy there to work together. Uh, well, of course, the uh, Solarize Plus and Heat Smart programs are for uh, residents. Uh, I'm not, not, not a municipal program, but it's. Okay. Uh, I apologize. But 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 the idea is that the town would have to put their signature on the plan. You know that they're backing it, and uh, submit a plan to Mass CEC for approval. But it's not for the town, not for the municipality. It's for the residents in the town. So this is, I mean, uh, something that supplanters are replacing like the mass save programs that are already existing or? Uh, um, I'm not quite sure how it, maybe Mike can tell us. Uh, I'm not quite, I'm a little confused about how the mass save program, uh, I think the mass save program is for individual homeowners that they could take advantage of. Yeah, mass, this mass is save would a, be separate. A group buying contract for the whole entire town. It's the idea. So you have people sign up for it. Um, you know, sign, sign a contract uh, and, you know, hopefully we get, uh, you know, a few dozen people in town that would sign up for this. Uh, and um, that would that would make it, uh, you know, the possibility of getting a, a large, uh, larger group of consumers that wanted to purchase this stuff would make it uh, attractive for a, a supplier to offer a discount. It's the idea, even beyond what uh, the, um, um, uh, What's the program called, Mike? Uh, mass Save. Mass Save program. So hopefully so we'll be, be able to beat the Mass Save program. Okay. So this might extend to also things like generators, uh, things like that. Uh, well, um, it's administered by the Clean Energy Center. We want to be clean energy, so it's more like power walls for battery store. You know, for battery storage. Okay. Um, I don't think gas generators would be part of this. I hope not, because that's not, uh, you know, renewable energy. But um, uh, you know, heat pumps, uh, even geothermal, uh, solar, 
rooftop solar, solar. Hot, hot water as well as PV solar, um, electric vehicles. Uh, it's pretty much wide open as long as it's uh, renewable energy. I think even uh, 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 biofuels, pelletized stoves uh, are in the program, but I, I'm not in favor of those, but I think there, that's an option. Uh, so it's pretty wide open, but I don't think diesel generators would be you know, included. But it sounds like it's still, I mean, it's not even really launched yet. It's still in the infancy. I mean, so there's, you know, a lot we have, we have to learn before we... There's really uh, yeah, as far as uh, our involvement, I think this would be the third year for the program itself. Oh, okay. So there are, there are um, a dozen or more towns that have already <laughs> done this. I think, I think uh, there's, I think there's a forget maybe eight of them are in the queue for this year uh, that uh, that applied last year and and so they're going through the process of of um, getting bids and signing up uh, consumers custom, uh, residents uh, right now um, uh, let's see uh, I believe Marshfield is doing this uh, this year so anyways it's, it's not new for the state not new for a lot of towns but it's new for Cohasset so this can be done both privately as well as through the town? Yeah. Oh, yes. It can be done privately, too. We don't have to do it through an official state program. But uh, the advantage of doing it through the state program is that we get a little bit of marketing money uh, from Mass CEC. Not very much. I think $5,000 or something. Uh, we get some marketing money. And also, we have the, uh, you know, we can assure our residents that you know this is a good program. You know, it might gain, gain better acceptance with uh, our residents because they'll know that the town has vetted it and believes it's a good deal for them. So it might might uh, get a better, you know, might be more successful if we could do it through the town. That's the idea. But it's not required. We could we have a private program too. Um, if the town doesn't want to do it. Uh, we could have a, a private program, and then it would be a community group. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the alternative energy committee that would run it. It would be a, a private uh, community group that might uh, try to organize it. So, those those are kind of the options there. Thank you. <laughs> and um, following up on your question, because that should have been a bullet, I think. Um, Mary Jo and Pat, could we get an update on your work as liaisons to the town hall committee? Um, I can I can tell you that I don't have an update. Uh, there was going to be uh, Michelle. You may know what happened with the last meeting. There was a um, uh, Pat sent me a note about the. Um, Electric vehicle, Pat. What, what you were actually discussing the possibility of funding for um, uh, the charging. Is that correct? But I think the the um, I received the message and tuned in, and the uh, meeting had been postponed. So, otherwise, I and what I understand from my neighbor is that they really haven't moved forward with any anything that is um, significant just yet. Okay. They've, they've postpone major decisions. All right. Just, so Corey, just so you know, Mary Jo and Pat are the alternative energy liaisons, committee liaisons to the town hall planning. So we all try to help. Oh, sorry. Make sure that those are considered. Yeah, go ahead, Michelle. Oh, so I was just going to say we did have our meeting last night. Um, and we really aren't at the phase where we're talking about anything having to do with the building systems, if you will. So we're still trying to figure out space needs and, and what size of a building we need to accommodate um, all of the residents and the town hall workers. Um, but we did have a list of guiding principles that we sent to the project manager um, before our first call. And on that, it lists energy efficiency um, I spoke to Pat yesterday and she really trying to think of creative ideas to get more charging stations in town. So as part of the energy efficiencies for town hall, we're going to request that we put additional charging stations in the parking lot as part of the project as a whole. So um, every um, 
request or or anything that you any idea you have um pat reached out to me and it's it's as simple as just getting it on the agenda and, and talking about it we're just not quite there yet but it doesn't mean that it, it gets lost so we, we do put it on the guiding principles document and it's it is a working document that's terrific thanks michelle and michelle the um third party consultant that was retained or the general manager or something, if I recall, so the, the person had credentials associated with sort of renewable energy and... Yep, so that was, that was the architect firm, yep. uh, Johnson Roberts Associates. So they do have um, some past experience with some renewable energy and energy efficiencies and they have a pretty um, extensive resume. So. Okay. All right. Um, Pat, just for the minutes, make sure that we have an action item for Steve to follow up on the Solarize Plus and Heat Smart programs, <laughs> which I know he will anyway, but we like putting it in writing. Okay, so electric vehicle charging stations, is um, there anything else to update on that, Pat? Michelle just mentioned that you're looking at increasing electric vehicle charging stations at the town hall site. Yeah, so Mike and I spoke about this, um, just trying to think through that VW settlement money in yeah. terms of what we could actually you know, try to site somewhere. And it had some constraints associated with it. And I think um, Mike jump in here if I get it wrong, but I think you had to have um, 15 or more employees in the location for the, to qualify for the grant. And um, so we were trying to think of locations in town that you know, would actually have 15 employees and uh, the only places that we could think of were associated with either town hall or, you know, the schools, et cetera. So um, as a part of this, I went back to talk to Michelle about, you know, trying to align that with the town hall piece, just so, um, you know, gets not off the radar, but also the, the issue with the VW grant is any site that we choose has to also be handicap accessible. So the problem with the schools was that they couldn't necessarily get the money to make those um, handicap accessible sites. So that was um, part of the issue there. Did I get that right, Michelle? So yeah, um, so we applied for the VW money last year. We were awarded a portion um, for the four sites that we had identified. Um, but when we were awarded the money, we weren't aware of all the constraints that came along with the money. Um, so when we started looking into it and looking at a contractor to do the excavation and, and some of the work and some of the electrical conduiting that had to happen, we realized that in order to do this, the sites would have to be handicap accessible. So we couldn't, we'd have to cut significant, have, we would have to have significant curb cuts um, in many of the parking lots. And it just became very costly and almost cost prohibitive for us to do. So we went back to National Grid and said, you're also offering incentives. What can we do here? Um, and they were able to give us more funding. So our out-of-pocket cost is much less and we are able to get the units that we want in the locations that we want. So as far as the VW money, um, there's no reason we couldn't apply for it again this year if we're gonna put them in the town hall parking lot because all of those spaces are handicap accessible because they're ground level. Um, so we can apply for it as it pertains to the town hall parking lot, but for the other sites that we were looking into, it just wouldn't have worked for us. And the schools aren't handicap accessible? So we would have to get it because the electricity has to come from almost behind where the business office is at the high school, middle school. So it was just cost prohibitive to run the electricity all the way to where we'd need it to go to get the charging station. Well, why would you have to run the electricity from the high school, middle school? So I don't know where the electricity would 
come from. When we had the engineer come in, they cited only one location where we could pull the electricity from and the run from where we'd have to pull the electricity from to the, to the available spots, it, it just was cost prohibitive. It's probably running it from the uh, three phase pad mount transformer. So depending on where that is at the school is where they'd have to tie off of the, the panel that they have in the school, maybe overloaded or at capacity. So they'd have to run um, new wire cable to the transformer. But what about Deer Hill and Osgood? Same thing. We, we didn't cite Deer Hill and Osgood for the charging stations. We only looked at the high school, middle school. So would it be worthwhile looking at the, because Osgood and Deer Hill are, well, Deer Hill's single level. So obviously handicap accessible and Osgood has an elevator. It's not the school that you have to worry about. It's the curbing that you have to worry about. So if, a, if someone pulls up in a vehicle and wants to charge their car and say they're handicapped, they have to be able to get to the charging station it has to be accessible for all. So it can't be up on a sidewalk. It can't be up on a platform. It has to be ground. It has to be level with the pavement. Okay, so we don't know if we'd run into the same constraints with Osgood and... Correct, we do not. So would it be worthwhile pursuing that? I think when the engineer's in town, because he's running the electrical now for the other four sites, uh -huh. we should have him go up to the schools and take a look. Okay, so why don't we do that? Okay. And the, how many people work in the Department of Public Works? 15, four? I would say, probably. I'm not, I'm not sure of the I mean, I just, you know, I wonder if um, it would I just, make sense to. I don't, I don't see guys that work at the DPW driving electric vehicles, I could imagine teachers driving electric vehicles i just don't see I, I mean guys that work at the dpw are pickup truck chevy ford type of guys well it's a question of the town vehicles <laughs> i mean <laughs> are you a chevy I, pickup truck I type we, guy, i think we're going to allow any resident to use these charging stations right right yeah. not necessarily uh, town employees but anybody in town is the VW money restricted for, um, uh, it was, I'm just, I'm thinking about the DPW site and thinking about town vehicles. Um, I'm definitely sensitive to, to Mike's thing. Although, you know, a lot of the, you know, new F-150s and stuff like that are coming with, you know, uh, uh, kind of the, the plug-in hybrid models coming out there. And, and I do think there's some traction there, but is it something where we could, you know, if the town, if the DPW or, the schools, like school buses went electric, that kind of stuff. Is it something where in the future, you know, having charging stations there would be good just municipally? Um, and is that, you know, if we, if we, if that's the focus, does that preclude us from using the VW money? Um, no, it, it doesn't. I think, I think we can look into additional sites. I think the reason we never cited um, DPW to begin with is because there's not a whole lot of parking there to be, there's not a lot of parking there. Um, so then to, allocate four spots for EV charging would be difficult because if you get this uh, VW money, you have to be open to the public. Um, so now you have four spots that are taken up by these charging stations. That was the only hurdle we saw. Um, it may just be a small challenge. We could maybe have the, um, the DPW guys park out back. I, I don't know. We, we didn't look into the site, but like I said, the um, electrician is in town because he's running the uh, electricity for the other places. So we could have him easily go over and take a look and just see what the undertaking would be. And if he thinks it's, it's doable, um, then we can have one of the engineers come down and take a look. Yeah, so if we could make this an action item, Patricia, um, for Michelle to coordinate with the electric or whoever she needs to coordinate with so that the electrician can look at the uh, Osgood Deer Hill Police Fire and DPW sites, and whatever their findings are for the DPW and the police fire station, that could be an input to our consultants. I think the consultants, part of our proposal was to have them take into account the potential for electric vehicle charging. Um, but if, if, if we can't have the electrician do all four sites, let's have 
the electrician focus on Deer Hill and Osgood because that seems like an obvious place in addition to town hall. To do given the constraints, for some reason I also think that the town parking. We have a charging station going in there now. We do one for the town yep. parking. In the town parking lot, yep, right next to the teen center. Okay, good, good. I just, my view is this is coming. I mean, the, the electric vehicles are coming. They're here. There's a reason why, one of the reasons why oil prices crashed as hard as they did is we're at the end game. It's not going to be the end game soon, but there's going to be more of that as the cooperative behavior starts to fall apart. Um, so I just, the more, if there's money now, I don't necessarily see a reason not to try to get charging stations in because I see this town as being the demographic that invests in electric vehicles. So as much, I don't know, I'm, I'm being grabby, but I look at it, there's money on the ground. Let's try to get it. Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll look into that. I think the electrician's on site tomorrow. So I'll just have a quick conversation with him to see if you can go to those couple of sites and see what's happening. That's great. And Mike, did you have something to add? Um, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. The VW program, I think three of the five programs are closed. And I think that was kind of like the low hanging fruit. So the last two that are open are kind of more difficult to navigate. Um, so I think the national grid option might bear more fruit with pursuing. I mean, it's definitely worth pursuing the VW. I just think it's going to be tricky. And if National Grid has already worked with us and are willing to, you know, provide money, I think maybe adding on to that may be more beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the VW is the electric school bus. Do they have an electric school bus? Um, that, that portion of it is closed. Mm -hmm. That was part of like the municipal um, column of the five programs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do we know who got the electric school bus money? I do not. Okay. Pat, uh, uh, could you make an action item? Does somebody want to research this and reach out to those towns? Or any town in Massachusetts or New England that has electric school buses? Because we've talked to capital planning and they, the school bus lease is coming up, I think next year. And so um, they're open to looking at electric school buses. And that is part of the review for the grant money for the DPW site, which is where they park. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to look into it, um, reach out. Um, I reached, I think I signed up for Bluebird um, electric buses. They're mailing flyers. Uh, I don't know if I've received anything yet, but I'm happy to see if there's any towns that have pursued it and have had any luck. That'd be great, Mike, if you could do that. Yep. Okay, action item for Mike. Woo! You cannot escape unscathed. <laughs> we can get so much done, Corey. Now you can see we've got an active, active committee. Okay, uh, anything else on electric vehicle charging station site? This is a great update and great opportunities. Anything else on this before we move to a community aggregation update? Okay, Steve. All right, um, I talked to uh, John O'Rourke today. John is the, uh, is, is the marketing uh, manager for Good Energy, our energy broker, and uh, asked him if he had any update on progress, and really there's no, nothing to report. He, um, uh, Good Energy has nine towns with uh, plans submitted to the Department of Public Utilities all waiting for approval. And as far as he knows, and I guess he had his lawyer check check with uh, the DPU people and nothing's happened uh, because of COVID. So he doesn't think that we're gonna get approval of our plan until uh, after uh, Labor Day, um, unfortunately. And then, you know, bids, he, he would think that bids would go out in, in the winter in December or so. Um, you know, this, uh, the COVID thing is really uh, delaying us here a lot, but, but nothing yeah. we can do about it, I guess. 
Yeah. Could you ask him, Steve, if um, how this works? Is he getting bids from new projects, from new projects with excess energy, or existing projects with excess energy? Just because you know we talked early on about wanting to get some sites in Cohasset. Um. Is he just, I mean, where's the energy coming from? Oh, uh, I don't know. I, I think uh, good energy um, uh, negotiates with just, uh, you know, energy suppliers, not, not with individual facilities, you know, energy suppliers uh, overall. And uh, the contracts are all um, the renewable energy certificates, uh, class one. Oh, okay. They don't do it through individual contracts. It's all renewable energy certificates. Got it. So it contributes to the demand. Uh, high quality ones, but yep. yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you, Steve, for that update. Are there any other matters not reasonably known in advance that we would like to discuss? So um, just a quick question. So Steve, did you have the sense that that um, good energy is in the same situation as every other um, vendor that's, that's, in other words, is there something unique to good energy? Is there a particular? Uh, I don't think so. There, recall there's only uh, two or three uh, energy brokers that do uh, uh, community irrigation programs. Um, uh, and good energy is one, you know, one of the major, uh, you know, one of the top, top ones there. Uh, and he has, like I said, nine towns, um, uh, proposals from nine towns into DPU. I don't know if all those are new programs or if, if any of them are renewals, but in any event, uh, he's, he's got skin in the game. And uh, I doubt, you know, I, I doubt very much whether good energy is in any different position from any of the, you know, the others. I don't see why, why it would be. Okay, thanks. I, my, um, when you were in a conversation with him, it's been weeks, but something you, you mentioned that there was a question that was asked of good energy, something specific to good energy. So I was just wondering um, what the status was in terms of any other companies that were requesting this type of, a, of um, kind of approval system. But it sounds as if we really don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I can't recall what that question is that you're referring to. Okay. Just we had one question at the public hearing. Is that what you're talking about? Um, there was, there, he mentioned that there was a delay, that there was, that, um, they were asking specific questions of, of good energy and that, um, that he felt that the, they, the company would be able to resolve it. But I, I'm sorry, I don't remember much more than that. So it was just well, a- there, there was one question at the, yeah, we had one question from the public hearing about somebody saying if they had a previous contract, uh, something about uh, how, how, how it would be handled if they had a previous contract. And um, yeah, I've clarified that for people a couple of times. If they have a, a, a third, a third party contract with another energy supplier that if uh, they're not going to be automatically enrolled, if they want to participate in the program, they would have to cancel that contract uh, themselves. Um, is that what you're referring to? No, I was actually referring to good energy itself, but um, that's okay. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure if we, um, I, I'm sure we're in good hands. I was just wondering if there was anything specific that, um, was was the source of this bottleneck that it was just a, a question whether... no i mean last last winter i was concerned because i hadn't heard from good energy for a while about their submittal to the dpu and uh, uh they had some details they had to iron out some uh changes in the in uh the plans that they wanted to make to all their all nine all nine towns that they were handling uh because of some feedback they'd gotten from the dpu that's uh, it. And it, took, it. It took them a while to do that. They had working through their lawyers, and I never got any details of, of exactly what that was. But apparently, it wasn't. Uh, uh, John assured me it wasn't of anything of any consequence. Well, in any that, event, 
uh, they worked through those it. issues and they got all the programs submitted to DPU in January. Uh, so that's, you know, maybe that's, that's what you're I recalling. See. That's, that's exactly, that, that sounds familiar. That's the conversation. Yeah. That, was uh, that was the issue about, I was a little bit worried because I didn't, you know, mm -hmm. he was supposed to have submitted, he, he had said he was going to submit the plans in December. It didn't happen in December, mm -hmm. but it did happen in January sometime. And mm -hmm. I was getting a little antsy there, but uh, anyway. Okay. All right. Not an issue. Okay. Anything else? And I'm just going to warn you, my battery is running low. So, and we like to keep this within two hours, <laughs> if not less. Um, anything else to discuss? All right. Listen, thank you, everybody. Again, thank you to our guest, Corey. Thank you to our liaison, Michelle, who is amazing as always. And to the committee members who are doing such a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle and Corey. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll okay. move to adjourn. Hi, Steve. Thank and you, Steve. Course, thank you very much, Tanya. My Who's, who seconds? Second. <laughs> okay, Pat, this is going to be easy. Steve makes a motion. Pat seconds. All in favor? Oh. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. Congratulations yeah. again. Bye, Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.